it seems to me a particular computation or mental uh, ability or experience is grounded by or supervenient on, to use another term of art, certain neuron circuits. Some neurons do some things, other neurons do other things. And what they do is identified with different functions. I also uh, meditate on whether a brain state that explains behavior has to be incorporating the, the state of every channel and every membrane of every neuron. If it does, the game's over. When it works best is when there's multiple competing hypotheses and you can conceive of an experiment you know, where the outcome resolves a set of questions more decisively. And it's exhausting and, and <laughs> you know. Yes, it is. It's true. This is Brain Inspired. That was the voice of Jeffrey D. Shaw, a familiar voice to me because I was a postdoctoral researcher in his lab at Vanderbilt University. I am Paul. Hello, everyone. Jeff has recently picked up and moved his lab to York University, and he has for years been studying the neural and computational decision mechanisms that guide, control, and monitor behavior. That's straight from his website. And the vast majority of his research centers around making decisions with psychotic eye movements in non-human primates and connecting the neural instantiation of those processes with mathematical models. A saccade, by the way, is the rapid kind of eye movements we make all the time to look at things, as opposed to smooth pursuit eye movements we make when we track objects moving in space. When I was in Jeff's lab, I worked on the neural basis of, and a model of, how we make decisions and choices, and how we can withhold our responses at the last second as we're preparing to make the response, something called response inhibition. That's just one of multiple tracks of research from his lab. So the circuitry involved in how we move our eyes is well known, which makes studying cognition in the realm of eye movements a seemingly straightforward process. But not so, my friends. It turns out there are many confounds and twists and turns, even in this well-known system, so that mapping cognitive or psychological functions and sub-functions onto the activity of single neurons and populations of neurons within circuits is an intricate affair. One of the reasons I wanted to have Jeff on the podcast is because he has maintained a few guiding principles throughout his career to help clarify how to ask the right questions and how to know whether the answers are reliable. So much so that every year in his lab, we reread the same set of papers that outline these principles. We talk about two of those principles today. One is called Linking Propositions, from Davida Teller in the 1980s, which is a systematic guide for how to understand the relationship between neural activity and psychological functions. And the other is called Strong Inference, from John Platt in the 1960s which is a systematic recipe for how to most productively and efficiently do science. We discuss these concepts in terms of the many projects Jeff has ongoing, and partly in reference to two review papers Jeff wrote, which go way deeper in the world of decision-making, with examples from Jeff's work and eye movement-related research in general. We also discuss uh, how the game may or may not have changed over the years, as we can record more and more neurons simultaneously, and relate those recordings to the large deep learning models we often discuss on Brain Inspired. We talk a little free will, among other things, and Jeff takes some guest meta science type questions. So I encourage you to read all four of the papers that I just mentioned, uh, which you can find in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 140. Thank you for listening. Support Brain Inspired on Patreon if you value it, or consider taking my online course about this emerging neuroAI world. Learn more at braininspired.co. Okay, enjoy Jeff. Jeff, we were just talking about how you don't age, uh, and you mentioned your knees, but I remember you you telling me that uh, you at least could dunk a basketball. How long has it been since you dunked a basketball? Oh, years and years, years and years. I enjoyed uh, coaching my uh, son when he was in middle school, and 
showing those boys how to run suicides. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The suicide makes me uh, hurt just thinking about it. Actually, it's, yeah. he, it's, he's not still playing basketball, is he? No, no. He actually is a police officer in Nashville now. He's a shooting instructor. Speaking of Nashville, uh, you were in Nashville for over 30 years, right? That's right. So at Vanderbilt University, where I was your underling, your, your postdoc there, where you taught me many a thing. Um, but you have recently moved to York University. Uh, and I know that it was uh, quite a process. I, I guess COVID has, has uh, had something to do with that. So what is your new title? I, I'm not sure, you're sure I even know your, your new title at York and the nature of your, of, of your job. Can you tell me about it? Well, uh, I'm a professor in the biology department in the Faculty of Science and appointed as the director of a center for visual neurophysiology. And what that means is that I'm uh, involved in helping plan um, and, and, and equip and, I guess, staff a uh, facility where non-human primate visual neurophysiology experiments will be done. So this is in the context of a large grant that York got mm -hmm. from uh, CFREF is the acronym in Canada. It's a $30 million grant or so. And York University committed additional funds to uh, fund new faculty positions and build a new building. And so the ground floor of that building will be a vivarium uh, in which uh, five researchers will do neurophysiology experiments of various sorts on vision and action. Uh, speaking of 30 years ago, you've been recording uh, neurons for quite some time. And, you know, you've told the story in many a lab meeting that I've been a part of, of how relative to these days, things have changed and how you used to um, sort of manually do things that are now automated. I'm wondering if you could just tell a story of how you used to go in and, you know, put a, put a, use holes in boards and such to uh, make experiments. Can you tell a story about like what that was like? And, and then we'll compare it to these days. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the, in the, uh, during the postdoc period with Peter Schiller at MIT, we made our own electrodes, glass-coated platinum iridium. So you had to etch the wire, make it the right pointiness, not too pointy, not too dull, and then uh, apply the glass coating with a particular device. And these things required uh, manual dexterity and skill, which only arrives through practice, mm. so you ruin a lot. Yeah. So once the electrode was made for the day, then you could uh, insert it in the uh, micromanipulator, the, the uh, device that was attached to the chamber on the monkey's head to it, advance it into his brain. But it was one electrode at a time, one contact, hopefully isolating one neuron at a time. And the isolation process was fiddling with knobs, the, the you know, Get voltage as a function of time on various scales. Mm -hmm. And at the scale of a, a neuronal spike, it's in the scale of, let's say, three or four or five milliseconds. So that's the trace of voltage by time on the oscilloscope screen we looked at. And there were other electronic devices, variously known as Schmidt triggers and, and other kinds of spike isolation devices that allow you to set thresholds in voltage and time mm -hmm. to generate a TTL pulse only when the voltage by time waveform satisfied the criteria that you set. And you kept an eye on those because over the course of the session, it would drift and change. And one could chase the electrode, I mean, chase the neuron with the <laughs> window discriminator and with the micromanipulator moving in and out. One neuron at a time. If you got one neuron a day, you felt real good. Oh, that's what uh, m my PhD advisor, Mark Summer, always always touted that as well. One neuron a day. That's a that's a great day. That's a little yes. a little different from these days. Which now you now you can't chase neurons because you have so many uh, electrodes on uh, so many leads on each electrode going down. And it's just massive populations of neurons that you're recording, and you don't really get to choose so much. Well, that's right. So one of the, I don't know if you say revolution, it's a technical evolution for sure, is the ability to put more than one contact in the brain, in more than one brain area. 
with either linear electrode arrays or Utah arrays or yeah. a variety of others, chronically implanted or, or placed day after day. One of the concerns, of course, is whether the quality of the isolation of the many neurons on many electrodes is comparable to what we used to do mm -hmm. when we could focus on one spike at a time. And um, well, there's different points of view about this, of course. And many people are working hard on algorithms that efficiently isolate spikes according to rigorous criteria. And of course, they never work perfectly. You're never sure that what you've missed and what you hit. Uh, but you can't sort spikes it infinitely. <laughs> and so other people have adopted the point of view that maybe it's not that important. That it's just the spikiness of the signal. And other frequency bands that provide a perfectly adequate signal mm -hmm. to do things with, like drive robot arms, let's say. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember feeling that consternation because I grew up, you know, recording one neuron at a time, maybe two a day. That was a great day. But then, you know, in your lab, we started using these multi-contact electrodes where, you know, you'd have to, <laughs> I, I constantly felt like I wanted to better isolate the neurons, but there's just nothing that you can do about, <laughs> do about it. So um, I, I'm not, I don't know if, how, do you feel like uh, you know, back in the day, the, were, were they the good old days recording single neurons uh, because you know that, you know, you could isolate them? Because there's a, there's a give and take also because recording one neuron at a time, you know, you're lowering the electrode, you're having your animal do a task, and you're listening for a neuron that's also sounds interesting, right, relative to the tasks, which also you can't do anymore. Um, was, was that the good old days? Or are the good old days gone? Or is this a better era? Well, this is a more informative era, for sure. We can, we can answer questions that were really mm. impossible or hard to answer before. So, for example, the uh, recent work we've been focusing on in the lab involves placing linear electrode arrays, like what you used in frontal eye field, mm. but placing them in areas where they can pass through the cortical layers uh, perpendicularly. Mm -hmm. Areas like the supplementary eye field or, or parts of V4 on the lunate gyrus. And so we can assess the properties of cells across layers in a manner like Hubel and Wiesel did and others, you know, in the 60s and 70s. But this information is, is rarely available in other cortical areas. V4 has got more than anywhere else, I think. But in the frontal lobe, there's hardly anything known. I just had Matthew Larkham on the podcast, and he makes the argument that we need to be paying more attention to where the dendrites are, not so much the cell yeah. bodies, right? So, you know, That's... thinking about recording across layers of cortex, how do you think about that, right? Because, you know, you have sources and sinks from a few years ago, and, and you're listening, you know, for the action potentials, which is the output of the neuron. But um, thinking about the dendrites and where signals are coming in relative to that, how does that affect your thinking about what you're doing? Right. That's a great question and a great connection. So one of the observations he, he is known for and others have made is the description of these um, calcium spikes that are emerging in the apical dendrites of layer five pyramidal cells. Um, so I've been fortunate to be in a collaboration with a colleague at the universe at Florida International University. His uh, name is Jorge Riera. So, in this collaboration, uh, one of the uh, products is a biophysical model of layer 5 pyramidal cell that includes these calcium spikes. So, we, we were thinking about that concretely. Mm -hmm. And one of the approaches, the validity of this has not been, um, well, I don't know exactly how valid this is quite yet. We haven't published the paper, had any reviews. But one of the approaches to looking at sources and sinks relative to a spike, let's say, recorded in layer five. So we can say we're in layer five because of the linear electrode array and other information that lets us align it. So a spike in layer five can be, we, we can synchronize the current density on the spike, do spike triggered current density. And when we've done that for uh, spikes in different layers, we see various kinds of patterns mm. that relate in interesting ways to the possibility that a current sink in the top could be those calcium spikes. Very good. Um, so in preparation to speak with you, every year 
in lab meetings at the beginning of this of uh, one of the semesters, right? Every year we would go through uh, a set of papers that you kind of hold as dear. And you know, I I reviewed those papers again. We're going to talk about some of the concepts from those papers, but it, it was really interesting going back thinking about where we are today with like these massive recordings and also the quote unquote machine learning or deep learning approach. And I, I want to get your reflections on some of these <laughs> uh, ideas, one of which is linking propositions. So I also went back and read your 2004 paper uh, on building a bridge between brain and behavior. Um, and by the way, one of the things that is fun for me is just how, maybe not that I didn't realize, but maybe I was just less educated, uh, of course, than I am now, but um, how much more I appreciate how steeped you are in the history of philosophy and all of the related issues um, related to mind psychology versus brains, which I didn't appreciate as much back then. So um, just a belated congratulations uh, and admiration to you for that. Thank you, Paul. So you, you wrote this in 2004, and you talk about linking propositions, and I'm going to ask you to explain what linking propositions are in a second. And then you, in 2019, 15 years later, um, revisit these ideas with updating with everything that we've learned about saccade production, response preparation, decision-making, visual attention. So I, I, I want to get your thoughts from back then relative to back then and how you're thinking today about linking propositions. Um, and where we are and where we're going with them. So what is what is a linking proposition? Well, linking proposition is a is a term of art that I didn't uh, formulate. It comes uh, through Davida Teller from a, a, a vision scientist named Brindley. But the concept is that there's certain identifiable, let's say, psychological functions, or cognitive functions, or perceptual abilities. So which neurons enable that ability and the neurons that enable that are the are the bridge locus the place where the linking proposition holds so if we want to study visual decision making let's say it's unlikely the olfactory bulb has much to do with that so part of the identification of the, of, of, a, of a linking proposition is ruling out the neurons or the circuits that can't be involved and this, of course, is a process of elimination where you falsify certain hypotheses, which brings us to the strong inference approach, which was one of those papers. So, the, so it just said, it puts in more concrete terms what it seems to me everyone believes in some sense that a particular computation or mental uh, ability or experience is grounded by or supervenient on, to use another term of art, certain neuron circuits. Some neurons do some things, other neurons do other things. And what they do is identified with different functions. So I, I don't regard it as a very controversial concept at all. The, its value is in grounding it and, and slowing the thinking down to avoid, many, many authors will write, and I've written this too before, you'd say this neuron represents this. Right. Well, what does represent mean? Right. <laughs> In what sense is it represented? And so there's more to say and more to unpack in that concept. And the concept of linking propositions provides a path to help you think these things through. But even so, it, Go ahead. Well, it just structures uh, a set of logical inferences that have to do with you know, A, if the neurons do this thing, then that mental state exists. If the neurons are disabled, the mental state doesn't exist. If the mental state exists, according to another measure, the neurons better be active, and, and so on. It, it, it makes us slow down and think about what we mean. And then the bridge locus concept reminds us that, that we're not sure what level of description is the adequate one. Mm. So in that paper, I also uh, meditate on whether a brain state that explains behavior has to be incorporating the, the state of every channel and every membrane of every neuron. Mm -hmm. If it does, the game's over because we can't even, we can't measure it and we couldn't keep track of it if we could. Probably it doesn't though. Just like, and this is this concept of functionalism. I mean, we're, uh, we're running 
a computer program that lets me see your image and you hear me through the internet. I don't know if you're running a Windows machine or a, or a, or a Mac, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter. It matters fundamentally. I can't put my CPU in your computer nor yours in mine if we're not wearing, you know, using the same hardware. But somehow software is different. So the same software can run on different hardware. The, you didn't use the term multiple realizability in that paper, I think, but that's essentially what we're talking about. I don't know if that was not a term. Well, it, it, it's a concept I was familiar with, and, and I think it's that paper near the end. I'm, I'm, I'm meditating on how. Was, I'm sorry, I haven't looked at that paper in a while. <laughs> so I close. So there's the problem of a related problem in all this is if all we do, if all behavior is caused by neurons discharging and glands secreting, and there's nothing else, well, that's a very deterministic position. And according to many people, then there goes free will. You know, how can how can my wants be anything I control if they control me. Mm -hmm. And yet, in the law and in personal relationships, we do hold each other accountable and we do excuse each other. So the reasons for actions matter, at least in social discourse. And so one of the challenges is reconciling intentional reasons with neural causes. And the multiple realizability, according to many philosophers, is that is is is, is, is that crack in the window that allows mm. for planning of alternative futures to mean something, to think about, what, do I want to live in Durango, Colorado, or Pagosa Springs? <laughs> Until you committed to one or the other, those were both li lively, viable possibilities. Decision-making, and specifically psychotic decision-making, is kind of in this sweet spot, right? So thinking about a, a bridge locus and linking propositions, for let's say, um, you know, like a motor neuron that innervates the muscles, right? Well, that's pretty clear. But And in that paper, and in your more recent paper, you still, I believe, worry that higher cognitive function is not necessarily amenable to this approach, right? Well, that's part of what was going on with this trends in neuroscience paper is thinking about what we can know and where our uncertainties are in terms of a of, of, of bridge low side for, you know, let's say the stochastic accumulator decision making kind of framework. So, um, the work that you were involved in at Vanderbilt that, that several of us have been working on sparked from the the race model of the of the stop signal task, the countermanding task. Well, the race model that Gordon Logan formulated explains how behavior in this particular task arises. And it's an abstract model, as you know, a goal and a stop process that have random finish times and they don't interact. The end, that's the model. And the mathematics of finish times let you estimate a quantity that you couldn't otherwise see called stop signal reaction time. Well, for the first, you know, 15 years of its existence in the literature, you know, it was, it was a number you could get from behavior and it changed in kids with ADHD and other disorders, but what it was neuro neurally was entirely unknown. Mm. So then Doug Haynes, a long time ago, ran into the paper and suggested we do it with monkeys, and, and it turned out to be very useful and informative. So we found neurons doing just what they needed to do to be implementing that race model, but now we've got this level of description of an abstract math model and we got neurons, and, and we need to communicate across those levels more deliberately, which leads to the interactive race model, uh, part of which you accomplished in, the, in that iScience paper. You mentioned Gordon Logan. I'm just kind of curious where he is where he is in thinking about neurons. Does he care about neurons these days, or is he still? Because is, it was interesting lab meetings um, to have you although you appreciate psychology and you know the math psych models but um you know hardcore neurophysiologist and then gordon on the other side being a sort of hardcore i don't care about the neurons this is the way the model works and it was hard to uh move forward on the psychology of these things and and meetings so uh, do you know where he is uh these days on that <laughs> well we're still collaborating 
uh, with Tom Palmieri mm-hmm. and 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 a, and a group of really talented postdocs. He's still animated by the questions. We're working on one project right now that uh, was was launched with uh, another postdoc several years ago, Brahm Sandbo, who you knew. Brahm recognized that we should call it e pluribus unum. Hmm. And it was a, a not a model, a simulation of how ensembles of ramping or accumulators can make reaction time distributions that are realistic. Well, we're, we've extended that more recently to a choice version. So there's two ensembles of ramping accumulators, and we can now instantiate speed accuracy trade-offs and try and understand how these, these ensembles of accumulators um, work together. They're not interacting yet. But a number of interesting ideas have emerged about how speed accuracy trade-off could be governed that are, are beyond just changing the threshold which is the standard psychology model way. Out of this has also arisen uh, some new insights into the judgments of confidence that one can probe after having made one of these choices. So in doing this work, uh, Gordon and Tom and I have different views about what we're doing. So I, well, and it comes to the use of the word simulation. So we've debated whether EPU is a simulation or a model. Mm. The reviewers treated it like a model that could be parameterized to fit behavior and explain something. And in my view, that's not what it is. What we're doing is simulating the essential aspects of a particular group of neurons and then evaluating that performance. One of the things this new modeling is doing, because we have choices now, is instantiate choices across the speed accuracy trade-off and then you know, simulate distributions of correct and error RTs and then fit those with one of the psychological models, like mm-hmm. the linear holistic accumulator. And so it's been an interesting thing to explore, you know, as above, so below. Is, are the parameters of the of the psychology LBA fit to the performance of the supposed neural instantiation? Do they map onto each other very nicely and accurately? Um, so we're still all engaged, but our unique perspectives coming from our careers lead us to this rich, uh, ultimately synergistic outcome. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this um, later, but I'll, I'll just ask now because because of this kind of you know collaboration with psychology writ large, I, I suppose, you just use the word rich, right? You know, how important is it for, let's say, a neurophysiologist to, you know, um, get that perspective from the other side, quote unquote? I mean, it's been a very productive collaboration, you know, specifically with Gordon and Tom. And I know, you know, there's lots of others, but since we're talking about Gordon and Tom right now, yeah. Um, but it's also sometimes causes a little friction, I remember, as well. Uh, but I, I suppose we need that friction to make progress. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, the, the friction happens just when either of our collective assumptions are violated or, or, or compromised, and we have to think, you know, why are we saying this? Mm-hmm. How do, why do we think we know this? And out of each of these... Um, as you said, sometimes uh, 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 fractious and even heated conversations, because we care, comes new insights that would not have been arrived at unless we'd have engaged like that. I mean, why should a neuroscientist know about psychology? It's certainly because that's what the brain does. If, if, I mean, one could study the brain just because it's a cool organ in and of itself. It's yeah. beautiful anatomically and in, in sort of an inner working sense. And the investigation of other organisms and other nervous systems is, is, is really interesting and really also enriching. But if we're interested in human behavior and, you know, dealing with um, disorders of human behavior and cognition and emotion and so on, if we want to relate neuroscience or neurophysiology, let's say, to the human condition, we need to say what the human condition is accurately and use words carefully. The problem is 
the, the scientific terms of art, like decision or attention, that we, we try to use those in a scientifically rigorous sense, yeah. but they're words we use commonly every day when we go home with our kids. So, again, back to the linking proposition idea and, 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 and a math psych approach, the goal is to expose the assumptions in the use of the words and eventually, ultimately, to kind of replace the word with its kind of more functional, even mathematical or neuromathematical uh, underpinning. Going back to the, you know, the idea of linking propositions, another thing I was struck with revisiting the whole decision-making, quote-unquote decision-making literature specific to psychotic <laughs> eye movement-related decision-making and choosing is just how thorny um, every step is, right? And how detailed and rigorous one must be to study these things. And in some sense, going back to what I was saying earlier about the right level of the cognitive process to study, that links up with the idea of a bridge locus and linking proposition, which seems most amenable to the neuron doctrine, right? Of uh, Horace Barlow, back when single neurons were considered to be doing cognitive functions. Um, but even this one little step, the psychotic system in terms of visual attention and, and choosing targets uh, becomes really thorny with the linking proposition. And, and you know, you, uh, <laughs> again, something I admire, have that rigor and that attention that is required um, to go down this road. But even in something that is, you know, maybe less higher cognitive, right? Uh, like decision making in two alternative uh, force choice task, even then it sort of explodes, and there are so many different issues. So, how far do you think the the concept of linking propositions can take us in terms of quote unquote higher cognitive functions, emotions, and you know this deliberation process, et cetera? Right. Well, I want to make sure I'm hearing the question. Well, the question is how does it how does the linking proposition framework translate to uh, more complex mental states and behaviors? Which you which you mentioned in two thousand and four uh, that yeah. that we may not be able to get there, right? Right. Well, we sure are not going to get there without having gone through the effort of figuring it out for simpler systems. I mean, we worked out the hydrogen atom before we did any others, right? <laughs> You got to, you know, you, you, you walk before you run. But certainly, so, so there's, there's, a, there's a, a bifurcation here. On the one, so that we can talk about a higher order function, language, social cognition, that sure. kind of stuff. Yeah. That's one way to go. And, and we can. The other thing is the single neuron is, is recording that neuron. Is that neuron the bridge locus? Mm -hmm. Surely no. I mean, it's, that neuron's embedded in a circuit. And now we're now, okay, well, how big is the circuit? Which, where is the circuit? You know, what are the boundaries of the circuit? Which neurons are part of it? I'm obviously, now there's going to be anatomical connections, but I can draw a path from the olfactory bulb to the visual cortex too. It's a roundabout path. Right, right. Well, that's not the circuit we mean, we think, right? So again, these, the, 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 Framework of the approach to, to, to identify the questions that need answering, I think, is going to be useful all the way through. Then also, I mean, this kind of refers to the calcium spikes too. Neurons have properties that we didn't anticipate, things Horace Barlow didn't know, like calcium spikes and apical dendrites. Active dendrites in the first place took a while to understand. Right. And even in the brainstem, like the models of saccade production, just saccade production, eye movement generation that David Robinson, you know, of, of Johns Hopkins, those models are, are, are powerful and effective because they translate into the clinic effectively and help with diagnosis. But what's been discovered is that there are properties of the membranes of certain neurons in that brainstem circuit that were it not for that ion channel, it wouldn't work the way it needs to work. So, you know, okay, well, that's the bridge locus too. And we are talking about channels. And it's a good thing we are because there's certain drugs that can be given to mm. act on that channel that treat eye movement disorders. So, you know, we don't want to be hamstrung by these concepts either. Now, for something like social cognition, for example, 
I guess we can use that as an example or, or um, you know, more complex decision making about interpersonal relationships and stuff like that. It's still the brain doing it. And maybe the olfactory bulb is more involved now, right? Because, <laughs> well, you know, how someone smells matters. Right. But um, it's not clear to me that it's a qualitatively different problem. It's less, we know less about it. And maybe, it, and if we're talking about language like what we're doing, it's, it's a uniquely human capability, which means there's certain data we may never get. Right. But that's sort of an ethical thing. Scientifically, the phenomena underlying the data we would like to get are happening in our brains too. Do you think that the single neuron doctrine set neuroscience and or psychology back? Or do you think it was kind of a necessary stepping, to, stepping stone because now people talk about the population doctrine, right? Right. Well, I don't think that single neuron doctrine or, well, even the word doctrine is kind of self-congratulating, but you know, that's the data we had. We had spikes of neurons. And as we said, we can only get one at a time and it was sure fruitful. We discovered their tune for orientation and motion direction. And if you show a monkey a rivalrous stimulus like Nikos and I did, well, some neurons discharge when, you know, the, the, the motion is the thing the monkey says he sees. So single neurons are pretty smart. But again, they're embedded in networks. Right. But like a place, you know, in a cortical area like frontal eye field or superior colliculus, you can still record single neurons and it's, you know, you have these distinct types of responses that they give. So some are like vi respond to visual stimuli. We'll just talk frontal eye field for a second. Some mm -hmm. uh, resp respond just before a, an eye movement, right? It's like a movement neuron. And then there are some that are in between. Um, so you can kind of make a story out of recording these single neurons in an area like frontal eye field, but then you get into an area like supplementary eye field or other parts of the cortex, right, where it's less clear or there's more variety in the types of uh, responses of neurons. So in some sense, you know, the frontal eye field is a good area to be in if you want to make these linking propositions, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Because you can tell, you can make progress um, in that way. Well, it's true, but but partly because the questions were well enough framed and there was a background of knowledge and so on and so forth. So you're right. When you move to an area like supplementary eye field, where you've recorded too, it isn't quite as clear. But the same kind of deliberate approach that says, let each neuron tell its story mm -hmm. and develop, well, mathematical models of alternative functional processes that they could be engaged in or, pardon me, representing, um, has allowed us to sort things out. And, and so one paper the, that uh, Amir Sajjad is the first author on in Nature Neuroscience describes the laminar organization of supplementary eye field neurons uh, in monkeys doing the stop task. They're not doing stopping. They're not doing re reactive inhibition. But there's a lot of neurons active when monkeys make errors. And when they're going to get their juice mm -hmm. or when they're not going to get their juice. And so those neurons can be distinguished functionally, like when do they discharge and how does the variability and discharge rate relate to other parameters. But importantly, they're also different in their distribution across the layers. So if they're different in function and they're different in layer, they're certainly different in connection and morphology. So now we're at that circuit and neuron level. We have another manuscript that is being, it's been accepted at Nature Communications from growing out of the same data set describing three other kinds of neurons that, that you would recognize. You'd see the profile and say, I saw that neuron before. Uh -huh, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. But now there's sort of some other explanations for it, some other possibilities for interpreting it. And so there's a next step. Now, from the population coding idea, of course, lots of Lots of labs are happy to put many electrodes in and then, and then combine the activity as a whole through dynamical systems approach, information theory, other, you know, other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Now, much of that, in, in, in my understanding, has been for the purpose of uh, brain-machine interfaces, you know, making right. a robot move out of motor cortex, right? So now it's an engineering problem. And 
it doesn't really matter how the brain works. It matters how my robot works and how I connect my robot to the brain. It's a decoding problem. Yeah. Yeah. So more power to them. I mean, this is, this is important. If they can make progress and help people, fantastic. But I don't think we should deceive ourselves into thinking that's how the brain works. Because structure and function are so intimately connected that if you ignore the layer in which a neuron is recorded, for example, then you, you're missing a big part of the, of, of the essential neuroscience story. Okay, so this, this brings me to uh, deep learning, right? And these really large mm-hmm. deep learning models that have become all the rage and that we discuss a lot on, on this podcast it's interesting. I have a a slide in the course that I, that I create all about this neuro AI landscape, and it, it shows the old way of doing things where you have a hypothesis, and then you might build a model, uh, and then the new way of doing things is you build a model and you train the model, and then you know, and then you compare the model to your data. But what I realized, embarrassingly, going back and reading the strong inference. John Platt paper is that I need to update the slide because you don't make a hypothesis. You need to make multiple alternative hypotheses, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know if you want to discuss, um, you know, well, maybe you could just discuss, uh, describe what strong inference is because it's a pretty a simple thing. And, and then I want to ask you about what your thoughts are on this alternative approach of just creating these really large models, training them, and then comparing them to brains and whether that is amenable to a strong inference approach. My understanding of strong inference is that it, it, it's basically eighth grade science, the way we were taught. Right. <laughs> Which no one does. <laughs> right, right. It, you ask a question that you can answer, and, it, and the answer is yes or no. A very Sherlock Holmes kind of approach. So that if the answer you know, whatever the answer is, you have some uh, confidence that the state of the world is such that it's A and not B. And then if it's A, it could be A prime or A double prime. So now we do the next experiment. But it, it requires grounding the hypothesis in a, kind of a, a rigorous network of statements and concepts and facts and math and so on that allow you to articulate something meaningful. Sometimes, now let's be clear, that works when you know something well enough to ask that question. The right questions, yeah. Yeah. Lots of aspects of brain science are still exploratory. So it would be premature to to be too rigorous in your hypothesis testing until you know enough about what's going on there. So, you know, kind of just looking and seeing what's going on, there's still plenty of room for that. But... It, it, when, when it works best is when there's multiple competing hypotheses and you can conceive of an experiment that divides, you know, where the outcome resolves a set of questions more decisively. In a sort of Popperian falsification process, I suppose. Well, that seems to be the most rigorous, doesn't it? And it's exhausting and, <laughs> and you know. Yes, it is. It's true. And it, it's rare that such. Papers get in the glossy journals for some reason, mm. and that that's a driving force, a, a social influence that we all have to acknowledge. But um, again, those social influences are not what how scientific progress, sci- rigorous scientific process happens. I mean, just because the church said he shouldn't, Galileo did see those moons, <laughs> and that's that. What do you think of the? You know, you you know, training a deep learning model and then comparing it in a in a sense, you're not really even asking a question. Do you see? Is there room? Uh, you know, within the machine learning kind of modeling approach and um, comparing it to brain data, is there room for strong inference using that approach, or is this something that is less than ideal in your eyes? Well, it's a great activity because the, the 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 network can do things for us. Maybe some of the things it's doing for us, we should think more carefully whether we want that done, like facial recognition that misidentifies certain categories of people more likely than others. So now it's a social problem, right? Right. But the scientists have to be responsible for that. 
if we stay closer to this world of like, how does the brain work, understanding how, 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 it, how intelligent systems, networks work, there's things to learn from the, the, the kind of uh, uh, machine learning neural networks. I, mean, I think everyone should appreciate that in the beginning of kind of modernish neuroscience in the 1950s is arising at the same time the computer's being invented mm-hmm. and Turing and uh, McCulloch and a lot of people, are, they're, they're all the same ideas. So that, that they should be considered separate seems artificial too. Now, with the machine learning networks, there's also, uh, because they're so powerful and because they're so complex, often the, the, the person selling the service cannot explain how they work. Right. And that's becoming an pr- increasing problem. As you know, I've, I've been involved in another kind of activity in, at the interface of law and neuroscience. Yeah. And so we invite the students to think about situations where an artificial intelligence system, like in a, in a hospital setting, for example, leads to a bad outcome and the patient wants to sue the hospital, when, when the doctor cuts off the wrong leg, we know that the doctor made a mistake and why and how we see how the system did it. Right. If the AI system, if no one knows how it works, it's hard to assign blame. And so I'm, I'm familiar with a, a new, or it's new to me, growing interest in, uh, in the phrase explainable AI so that we understand how it works well enough that we can trust it. And when it goes wrong, we know why and what to fix. But so, so thinking about in terms of models of the brain, right, there's this problem of model mimicry um, mm-hmm. that has, well, I won't say plagued because the, the problem is that multiple different kinds of models can explain psychological behavior, essentially. And a lot of what your research program has been about is using neural data to decide which is the better model because there's this problem of model mimicry and it's and so you know we were talking about the race um, model where it's very simple there's a a a go accumulator and a stop accumulator and they're racing right and this that's two units and then you know you can add more units for choice and things like that but then these really large deep learning models it seems like model mimicry uh, would become more of an issue because lots of different deep learning models can be trained to do the, the, the same thing. So then to adjudicate between, to say something about how the brain is doing it, you know, and, and there are people like Jim DiCarlo who, you know, set up like a convolutional neural network and then the layers of the network seem to map on to activity in layers of our, in hierarchical layers of our visual cortex. On the other hand, you could probably make 30 different models uh, of the same ilk that would also explain a lot of the variance. So how much, you know, how much of a problem do you think model mimicry is in this deep learning approach? And by the way, before I can, before I forget to tell you this, it was funny. Um, I had someone in uh, a discord server that I run for um, the podcast supporters who said he was uh, using a, (laughs) a recurrent neural network with one unit. And it looked like the, like one like you know recurring unit yeah. and he said it looked like what was happening was the unit was just accumulating to a choice and i was like <laughs> oh okay you just built a uh <laughs> yeah yeah you just built a model like i used to work but in a recurrent neural network quote unquote you know yes. in those deep learning yeah. terms anyway yeah. just funny. To make sure you heard that thank you well my my instinct is to say if we're talking about object recognition, let's say, sure. let's keep it in, in, in the DiCarlo lab framework. Mm-hmm. And we can tell cats from dogs. And now the network can tell cats from dogs. Now, your brain and my brain are not identical. Right, right. I mean, we, we both have V1 and V2 and so on and so forth. But at different places in the network, they're going to be radically different because your dog and cat growing up are different from my dog and cat. So at some point, there's differences. And yet, at the level of is it a dog or a cat categorization, we both satisfy the goal of the task. So this is one way I've thought about, you know, if you if you can build N convolutional neural networks, and they all tell dog from cat, mm-hmm. starting with pixels, you know, so there's the V1-ish thing. And at the end, it's that's a cat, not a dog. The stuff in between is going to have 
can have as much variability as can be the case, but there's going to be some aspects that are similar across all systems. For example, I think, I mean, I don't know that this is true in all the, all the convolutional neural networks, but I, I think I've understood that the input level is more granular, higher resolution, then you get the lines and features, and then you get components and surfaces, and then you get objects. Mm -hmm. So that flow seems to be the way to do it. I don't know, has anyone built a system that doesn't have that sequence or could have any other sequence? I don't know. Good question. I mean, that, that's all ventral stream, stream as well, and dorsal stream is a different uh, beast itself. Although people are building these hierarchical networks that are I'm unfamiliar and I should be with, you know, the, the authors and stuff and such, but there is being, there is progress being made in the dorsal stream as well, which is the, the how or, or where region. Yeah. Well, and in the motor cortex too. And so, yeah, sure. I mean, we think we understand that neurons are just nodes and networks where they influence each other through exciting and inhibiting and there's lateral inhibition and there's feed forward and there's feedback and there's recurrence. Well, that can be instantiated lots of different ways. And then it's a common function. Are students in your lab these days, is anyone wanting to use these kind of deep learning approaches? Because um, in my world, like everyone's using deep learning, right? So um, yeah, yeah, I forbid them. Yeah. So that, okay, that's what I'm getting at. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, we're just we're just dealing with different problems right now. But mm -hmm. uh this this problem space, of course, is one that's very active in Toronto, and uh, many of the York faculty are interested and in, active in this area. So it's it's one of the reasons that it was fun to move to York, where this kind of exploration is so vivid and, and active. So I'm going to harp on the deep learning aspect just a little bit more here, uh, because it's there. There's been this wave, right, with the quote unquote deep learning revolution of popularity and using these approaches to do other things, but also to, to study brain areas. And you've had uh, a long career, and so you've seen lots of waves of popularity of various brain areas, various cognitive functions to study. Right now, cognitive maps in the hippocampus seems very hot. It's hard to tell from where I, I sit. I know everyone has a different perspective on these things. Mm -hmm. do, so in your judgment, do you think that this little deep learning wave, is, this, is it here to stay? Do you think it's going to uh, pass uh, by and move along? Well, uh, I haven't paid as much attention to know. I mean, it is a tr it, it does feel faddish, of course. Fad, that's the right word. Yeah. 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 But it hasn't affected your your work so much, right? It hasn't. No, it doesn't. I don't. I don't read that literature to yeah. give inspiration and in how to think about things. Mm -hmm. But it. So on the one hand, it's it's incredibly useful and profitable. Mm -hmm. So they're not going away, and the the problem of uh, understanding when when a convolutional neural network goes wrong in a bank or a hospital or a, yeah. on a military device or something like that, yeah, that's serious. So understanding how they work, I don't think that problem can go away. And it's it's not clear to me that if you answer it for this network doing this thing, that it won't be that you'll not have to start all over again for a different network doing a different thing with credit cards now. Or, mm -hmm. I don't know. So that's active. Now, will they help us understand the brain? Well, as, as sort of intuition pumps about how you'd organize a ventral stream, I mean, my reading of the DiCarlo and others' work is that it sort of endorsed this idea. It satisfied us that starting with this granular, more pixelated representation of an image, gets features, and then they get bigger receptive fields that integrate more information that are shaping, you know, coming to surfaces and shapes and finally to objects, objects that you have to learn. So, you know, the greebles, nobody knew about a greeble until Mike Tarr and Isabel Gautier invented them. <laughs> now you can have greebles, yeah, you know? Right. So the learning element is a key part of this as well. So it, it feels to me like we've, we've had sort of an insight into how you make an object recognition system in a primate brain. What, I mean, what else do you want to know with them? I mean, 
the you know the varieties of networks that can well i don't know i mean i know at mit they enjoy these contests of networks you know the network that is the best right recognizer you know categorizer or whatever whether a network that categorizes as well as people is the network like the human brain i'm not sure that's guaranteed and it's not self evident to me that that's a, a, as useful an activity as exploring the human or the primate brain directly mm. but it may be again as we've said i don't live in this world right right well, that's why i wanted your perspective on it as well yeah but in terms of just fads let's say and not just you know the deep learning fad do you get better throughout your career of recognizing when something is going to is just a passing phase and what seems to be more important and will stick around well in my own work i feel like i i'm confident that i'm addressing the best questions i can address given where i come from and what i've done and resources and so on i mean there's other other really important questions other people are addressing it's like for example years ago i mean it's still the case but years ago when oscillations became a fad yeah i remember i don't remember what year it was but all of a sudden there at as at the society for neuroscience meeting <laughs> multiple labs were reporting oscillation for yeah, yeah last year they weren't working on that but now they are because you know so scientists are faddish like everybody else and again it's sort of the social uh the social currency of getting the glossy journal paper and 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 you know being perceived as working on the hot problem i haven't been motivated to chase the hot problem cuz i feel like i'm i'm happy working on these hard problems that seem relevant and, and fundamental there's a lot to do there's still a lot to do yeah yeah so it's a big tent though there's lots of room for lots of people to do things if we had enough funding oh that's the yes of course right to the representatives <laughs> what what's going on in the lab these days what's new what 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 are you uh working on and what's keeping you from making progress what's keeping you up at night yeah well there's three main things the linear electrode array data collection is is the big data collection thing and so i referred to some work in v4 and some work in supplementary eye field uh the v4 work was done by a graduate student named Jake Westerberg working with Alex Mayer and we've uh published some papers and there's more to come part of it was understanding how v4 the cells across the layers of v4 contribute to visual search performance uh both the target selection attention allocation and and you know in association with saccade production very very like what we've done before but in v4 now and so there's stories to tell about that and discoveries that that have been made the other aspect of this is relating the laminar distribution of local field potentials to the current source density that produces the eeg sig and so during visual search tasks there's an eeg event related potential component called the n2pc discovered by Steve Luck a long time ago and Jeff Woodman our uh, uh friend and colleague had worked on it and and recognized that there was a fruitful path to look at eeg in monkeys and understand where these different components come from so a uh, papers being revised for neuroimage in which we can do forward modeling we can mm. we can take the currents and convert them to dipoles calculate the dipoles those currents are producing and with a model of the conductivity of the head the brain the skin the scalp and the bone and everything calculate what the voltage distribution would be which is as unique solution we're able to do that only because we're collaborating with really smart people or Javiera is is the is the leader of this lab and the graduate student is uh Beatrice Herrera so the n2pc comes from v4 but lip contributes front line field while it has lots to do and influences v4 in the circuit as a biophysical generator of the n2pc has nothing to say or very little because it's 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 too far away and it's pointed the wrong direction oh okay gotcha so this is a really interesting insight that 
a given cortical area can be computationally critically involved, but biophysically invisible. Well, through, through EEG anyway. Through EEG, yeah, right, right, right. So, so that's one line of work. The other line of work is extending the medial frontal uh, recordings from mm-hmm. supplementary eye field down into both banks of the cingulate sulcus in the monkey. So Amir Sajad and Stephen Arrington have collected a, a, a rich database from two monkeys doing the saccade stop signal task with different reward amounts and kind of reversal learning component to it. And we'll be describing uh, how the dorsal and ventral bank of the cingulate sulcus and the fundus are similar are different to each other and overlying supplementary eye field and how each of them contribute to the error related negativity and the feedback related negativity you have so much going on still and there's one more to go yeah there's one more thing to tell you because this isn't even well the data is collected caleb lowe and thomas Reppert collected uh recordings from frontal eye field of, of monkeys doing a complex visual search task so it was complex in two dimensions, two interacting dimensions. And we, 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 we've never talked about this. You won't know about this. Okay. So uh, it's a color singleton search. So he's looking for the red among green or the red among not so red or the green among red or the green among. And, and he doesn't know what color anything's going to be until the trial, t- until the array is presented. Mm-hmm. So he's got no set for what the target is. And so they're in inter- right? So you got kind of easy search and hard search. That's one dimension. And then, then what he does with his eyes is dictated by the shape of the stimulus. Okay. And so in, in the first period, in the first run of this, let's say if it was vertical, make a pro saccade. If it's square, make no saccade. And if it's horizontal, make an anti saccade. Yeah. Hard to train this, I'm sure. Hard to train. Hard to train. And, and a smart monkey learned to cheat in a really interesting way. Now, uh, we manipulate the, the difficulty of encoding the cue by making the elongate, making the thing really long or really stubby. Now, in the data that we've collected, we got rid of the anti saccade for, for interesting reasons that you can find on a bioarchive. <laughs> paper with Caleb Lowe. But we now have what we could call, I don't know if this phrase works, I'm still playing with it, but it's two-dimensional decision-making. Psychologists would call it multi-factor decision-making. Okay. But in, the, in the, you know, the famous dots task, it's hard on one dimension, you know, motion coherence. Mm-hmm. So this is hard on two dimensions. The, the identifiability of the target from distractors and the uh, categorization of the cue. And those two factors are independent of each other. So you get distributions of reaction times that are fast if things are easy in both dimensions and progressively longer if things get progressively harder. So there's a, th- we, we learned uh, of a theoretical framework called system factorial technology. Okay. Which sounds like a mouthful. Yeah. And it is. Jim Townsend at uh, Indiana University conceived of it with his coworkers. But uh, everybody says signal detection theory and feels quite happy about it. But it's the same mouthful. And it's the same principle. You, you start with mathematical principles out of which you extract from performance key parameters. You know, in signal detection theory, it's discriminability and bias. System factorial technology is a sequence of analyses of the reaction time distributions that, under, under the appropriate assumptions, reveal the architecture producing the behavior. Is it, are, the, are the factors being uh, processed serially or parallel? Oh, okay. That are kind they of race or exhaustive, you know? So... The process, the process architecture, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So we've recorded neurons in front of eye field. And we know neurons in front of eye field, some of them select targets. And the time it takes to select the target varies with how discriminable the target is. Mm-hmm. We know other neurons make saccades. And when they turn on depends on how discriminable things are. And there's RT variability there. So 
the expectation is by looking at the time of modulation of different neurons, we'll be able to partition reaction time into these different operations. Uh -huh. They may overlap in time, but we may be able to detect that on the uh, premise that the different neurons, again, it's a sort of a strong inference approach, given that certain neurons instantiate one process and not another, then we can see when those processes begin and terminate relative to one another. That's on BioArchive, you said? Well, the Cheating Monkey paper is on BioArchive. It's an N of <laughs> one monkey, monkey paper. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we replicated the Bichot effect. Mm -hmm. So Kirk Thompson, when he was in the lab and Narcisse Bichot discovered that monkeys uh, <laughs> partially trained to do one color among another color in search have frontal eye field in which half the cells select the target immediately. They're color selected. Well, one of the monkeys, it was Darwin. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Memories, uh, flooding yeah. me with memories. Yeah. 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 So he had so much experience doing stuff that he saw right. the cheat. And so his frontal eye field cells discriminated the orientation of the cue right off the bat, right or off. many of them did, because he wasn't. He was just getting the cue, and he wasn't worrying about where the uh, where yeah. the singleton was till later. So this is similar to the uh, to this recent cheating monkey. <laughs> yes, yes. That's not that won't make it to uh because you have to have an N of two to publish in a uh, journal, right? So it's going to be forever bioarchive bound, I suppose. It's out there for people to find if they uh, want, they can evaluate whether the data seem reliable, and the conclusions follow. All right, Jeff, I told you I had a few guest questions. Um, two of them come from, you've mentioned a lot of people, two of them come from Brahm Zandbelt. So I'm going to play these questions for you. And then if we have time, I'll play a third from another previous. So I, I should say Brahm was a, a postdoc in your lab. I think he'll actually say this. So I'm going to play this and then you can react to it. Okay. All right. Hi, Jeff. I worked in your lab between 2011 and 2014. It was a privilege to work with you and with all the talented smart people in the lab, Paul being no exception. Quite a few Shaw Lab members from the period don't work in academia anymore. So my question for you is, how is it for you as a supervisor to see the graduate students and postdocs that you trained choosing a career path outside academia? This is a, um, I yeah. guess this is kind of a hot topic in uh, academic society. It seems like people are leaving in droves, especially these days. But so, yeah. Um, do you have a do you have a reaction to that or an answer? Well, I don't blame you. Oh, that's right. I'm I'm case point. <laughs> yeah, you're looking. At <laughs> well, yeah, and and the you is is collected. So I don't right. I yes. blame you. I don't blame Brahm. I don't blame you right. know. I mean, the most recent is this Caleb Lowe. That, that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So he was lined up to do a postdoc actually with Stefan Everling. Oh, right. Oh, he told me that. Yeah. Yeah. And a variety of things happened such that he just decided he wanted to work as a data scientist. Um, it seems that the training you, you guys collectively, not just in our lab, all the, all the labs like this, you, you, the training you get has market value out in the real world. Right. And so he seems to be happy doing that. Braden Purcell, uh, I don't know if he still is, but he, he after a really successful postdoc with Ruzba Kiani and a K99 basically in his pocket, chose to work for Squarespace. Oh. And, and that's fine. K99, by the way, is a grant that kind of ushers you into faculty position just for. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. 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 So, no, I mean, where I. At that time in life, faced with situations like we are, you know, limited grant funding, fewer jobs, various kinds of challenges, and and more opportunities than were certainly available when I was at that stage. When I was coming out of graduate school and postdoc, I don't think I was marketable for anything. Did you, did it, was it tempting to, to I mean, because you seem, you know, you're a lifelong at academic um rigorous scientist like I've like we've been discussing but have you ever been tempted to jump ship 
but on the other hand, you've been extremely productive. And as far as I know, you've always been extremely productive. And, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if that, that's played into it or, or, or what. Well, yeah, I never wanted a job. Well, so, <laughs> so the family business was uh, far, selling farm implements. And I guess maybe we can reveal to, the, to whoever might listen to this that, that you are living in the town over Wolf Creek Pass, uh-huh. Colorado, where I, where I grew up in a, in a farming community. So the family business was selling international harvester farm equipment okay. and Heston hay equipment and so on, shawl ironworks. And my dad came home every night. He said, if it weren't for money and people, this wouldn't be a bad job. Uh-huh. And so I never wanted a job with money and people. And of course, I didn't get that. But I, I have a freedom of exploration as a PI that yeah. is, is unlike what one has in the, in the business world where whoever says what you're supposed to do. So I always was committed to this academic path and just strove to do what needed to be done to be here and stay here. Not a lot of people have. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I just want to. I want to reiterate loud, loudly and clearly for everybody that uh, that and 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 each of you guys who's left the lab knows that I've supported you in these new positions. Yes, you certainly have. At least in my personal experience. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, it's a it's a new day, and when you get rich in the real world, <laughs> endowments are welcome. Ah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. But but isn't it? Um, I, I would imagine it's a little sad. I don't know if "sad" is the right word, but um, you know, because you invest so much time and effort in training us, then to have someone essentially not disregard, but then move on to a space where they're not going to be using that training necessarily in the future, um, directly anyway. Is there some some part of you that's a little sad when someone uh, takes a different course? Uh, I wouldn't say it's sad, but, but there's a, here's a reality. When you leave academics, my neuro tree doesn't grow anymore. Right, right. Nor your legacy, right? Because th- those are directly. Yeah, yeah. So as, as and again, I'm, I'm going to elaborate a little bit just for the benefit of those who might listen. In the United States, the NIH funds training grants. They're known as a T32 to institutions. And through all the years I was the PI of it, the renewals were accredited by the number of trainees who went on in academic careers. Okay. And the trainees that, that went into other careers outside academia just didn't count as much because they're not publishing papers. Mm-hmm. They're not sustaining the legacy of the, of the lab, the individual, and the institution. So that's a frank reality of it. Yeah. Now, I've never said to anybody, no, you have to stay unhappy in academics just so I can have another citation or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can vouch for that. You, you uh, always give a really nice celebration. I remember mine very clearly um, when I was moving on and um, have always been very supportive, which uh, I don't, you know, not everyone's like that. So another thing I appreciate about you scientifically wow. as well. The other thing. Well, well, let me, the last thought I want to make on this is almost everybody who's, who's left has stayed engaged or we've stayed in touch and we've published papers after the fact. So Rich Heights, mm-hmm. you over that briefly with, we're still, there's another paper on supplementary life field with, with Thomas Reppert leading it. Speed on the, on accuracy the speed accuracy trade off. <laughs> yeah. That, that manuscript will oh, revise cool. after cell reports right now. All right. Very good. All right. Here's Brahm's uh, other question. You earned your PhD in 1986 and started as an assistant professor at Vanderbilt in 1989. More than 30 years have passed since then. I'm curious, how has academia changed over the period according to you? What has changed for the better and what has changed for the worse? All right. So, yeah, I, I've been at Vanderbilt, or was at Vanderbilt for over 30 years, and now at another institution, so some comparisons are available. Um, so, here's a thing, here's one of the things that's changed for the better. That is, and, and it, was, it, was, it was vivid at, at Vanderbilt for a long time, and that is the interdisciplinarity. 
and the appreciation that you shouldn't stay in your silo. Mm. So the places, well, the interesting places are places where people can work across departments and faculties and colleges and so on uh, in a meaningful, collaborative way. And ideally, the institution either prevents or lowers barriers to that or even maybe rewards it by things like getting teaching credit for teaching a course that's for an interdisciplinary major and not your main department, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that's, that I think has improved or it's certainly changed over the years. One of the things, you know, a change for the worse is I would identify with the salaries of the, of the presidents and chancellors and the number of administrative staff or, or um, sort of the, the dean's offices have seemed to grow in uh, number and cost out of proportion to the, huh. what benefits faculty get and the salaries of the staff, you know, the janitorial and the kitchen and that kind of thing. So the, the factors that have led to disparity of wealth in businesses, you know, the CEOs making, I don't know how many hundred times more than the average salary, the same trend has happened certainly in U.S. schools. And so... Why is that? Do we know why? I, I don't really know. I think my experience in, 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 in interacting with the chancellors, the various chancellors at Vanderbilt and Provost is that uh, boards of trust uh, reward. Uh, oh, well, the boards of trust are many CEOs of corporations where that's the mindset is the first thing. The second thing is this, this almost illness to be the guy with the most money mm. and compare yourself to your peer group in all these various ways. And, and then, of course, <laughs> kind of the Kahneman Tversky thing that once you're a millionaire, Making another thousand isn't much difference. You have to make another hundred thousand yeah, to have yeah. to be different. And then when you're a billionaire, it's got to be a million more, you know. So it's an insidious process. But the 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 expansion of administration at universities and the sort of the the, the overhead that that's created in terms of just more forms to fill out, more yeah. well less efficiency. Do you think that's going to continue? Well, I don't know how. I don't know who's who's turning it around. How long are you going to be a scientist? How long are you going to be um, in academia? So I know you just started a new job, so this is terrible. Yeah. We won't play this for York no. University, perhaps. But uh, do you ever? Do you see yourself ever? Uh, it's not on the horizon, right? Retirement or no, anything like that? No, yeah. no. I feel very invigorated with the new kind of questions we're we're working on here. And new faculty, so new opportunities for other kinds of collaborations in a new environment. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not tired at all, and have, I haven't run out of ideas, and I still enjoy revising manuscripts and working with trainees to get the figure just right. Yeah. So the process yeah. is the process is what I enjoy, and I still enjoy it. I taught uh, in the winter term, taught a systems and cognitive neuro class, undergraduate class for a new undergraduate major here. And great students, great conversations. So uh, I feel very fortunate. Well, maybe here's a thing that's changed for the better too. In in many places, there's no mandatory retirement age. So I'll keep going a while longer. We were before we before I hit record. I was just marveling at how you don't age, so you don't look anywhere close to retirement. And I know you know <laughs> you you've. As long as I've known you, you've you've seemed invigorated uh, with these questions. It's quite impressive. Well, Jeff, this has been a lot of fun. I'm glad we finally got you uh, on the podcast, and I appreciate your time. And uh, here's to the next 30 years at York. Good luck with the new environment, and I hope it continues to go well. Thank you, Paul, and best to you and your and your lovely family in Durango, Colorado. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. 
The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stair-